Hello and welcome to St. Michael's Cemetery on this beautiful February day, beautiful crisp evening and we're delighted that you could, you will be able to join us in um, talking about uh, the cemetery itself uh, and also uh, what uh, the church is all about and when, it, when the church was built and erected. So. Perhaps we could start here, and as you can see, the, the, church, the church here has been renovated in the past few years. We put a new roof on it and new drainage, and also new pointing. And inside then, of course, when we go in, you'll see the new heating and lighting and um, new bell tower as well. Uh, in case you don't know, this particular cemetery was opened around 1862. And the church was a temporary church, it was built shortly after that in 1863 and uh, it was opened by Father Burke who was the original parish priest here. Now it was opened on the 29th of October 1863 and as you know the 29th of October is the feast of Saint Michael the Archangel and if you look above the main door here you'll see um, a statue of Saint Michael driving Satan into hell. If you remember that prayer we used to say at the end of Mass, Blessed Michael the Archangel, defend us in the hour of battle, be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. And the church itself, the original church only lasted about 10 or 12 years. It was only a temporary structure anyway. And then under the patronage of Mr. and Mrs. Foster, who actually gave the full amount of money for the building of this new church, which was £2,000. Uh, this new church was opened on the 26th of September, 1878. And I think it's time now that we make our way in there and talk about a few things uh, regarding the interior of the church.
Hello. So, as you can see, we've moved inside this beautiful church now, which, as I already told you, was opened in October 1878. And the church, of course, was built under the patronage of Mr. and Mrs. Foster. And there's a plaque up to the wall, a plaque in, on the wall dedicated to them here, and it cost £2,000. And uh, I'd like now, at this stage, to introduce Vincent Hale, who is a long standing parishioner, of course, of St. Vincent's. He goes right back to when the Vincentians were here, and um, he may like to say a few words now, please. I was first introduced to Rivelin Cemetery as a very small child because across the road opposite the gates is a stream uh, with a little area that was used by poor people, and we were poor, uh, to take the holidays. And the parents would sit on the grass and eat sandwiches, and the children would play in the paddling pool. And that was fine, but afterwards, although I have no recollection of it, my parents brought me across here because the family who ran the, the cemetery from its incept were called Murphy. Uh, in fact, this place was called Billy Murphy's Garden. And uh, Billy was a scholar and a gentleman from Ireland. His handwriting was copper plate, and he, the records were kept marvelously. But speaking as a member of the younger generation, with every generation, the handwriting deteriorated and it got worse and worse. Eventually, uh, his daughter, Eileen, who never married, uh, inherited the whole uh, business because the old man died. She had brothers who uh, uh, helped out and uh, dug the graves, kept the records, but eventually Eileen was left on her own and I then became introduced to her as an adult because being a solicitor, I had the occasional people wanting to trace their families. And I came here to see Eileen over such a family and I saw how she got the books out. They were enormous. There were four or five of them. They were kept for different purposes. One had numerical order of, of burials. The other had surnames of the people buried. Another one had the plots, uh, but the plots were difficult because they didn't leave enough room and they had to squeeze them in in very tiny writing as uh, more and more people were buried in the same grave. So I could see that Eileen had far more on her hands than she could cope with. Okay. And she was a very pleasant lady and, and uh, eventually I suggested to her that she might like to retire. I think she was almost 80 then. And she handed it all over to me. And I then computerized it. It took 15 years to put all the different books onto computer. But we are now in a position to look on the computer uh, all on one source, sort it, uh, ch check it up, search for names, and it is now in a very different okay. condition. Thank you very much, Vincent, uh, for that little blurb. And the next thing we do now is just um, explain to you what we've done to this building, because as I said, in the last two or three years, we've uh, obviously um, renovated it and put in new heating and new lighting in it. As you can see, we've done quite a bit of work on this building in the last few years, but maybe it's no harm now just to go around and look at some of the special features. Now, the first thing that I'd like you to look at is this west window here. And as you can see, it's of the guardian angel there protecting the child, and also on the right is St. Vincent de Paul himself. As you know, this church was built by the Vincentian Order, and they spent many, many years, 130 or 140, I think, here uh, in this particular parish. Now, the window, which was ere erected there or installed uh, in 1884, so, if the church was open in 1878, it was a few years after that before they put in this window. 
or install this window. And this window is dedicated to uh, Father Fitzgerald. Now, Father Fitzgerald was very well known in the early days in the parish because he had such a dedication to the poor that people thought that this window uh, was dedicated to him. It was only the right thing to do. We hear a lot about Father Burke, who was the first parish priest here, and maybe not enough about Father Fitzgerald, but he was dearly loved by the poor people. And in fact, it was because of his devotion to the poor that Mr. and Mr. Foster donated the £2,000 to build this church in the first place. Maybe Vincent now here might like to add one or two details to what I've just said. Uh, an amusing uh, uh, f feature of, uh, of what you've just said, Father, is that the present St. Vincent's Church on Pickmere Road could just as well have been called Fitzgerald Road because Fitzgerald Road is the next road to it that goes down uh, further into Walkley. Um, the, uh, the chapel certainly has, was very well attended from the start. The monthly mass at Rivlin was a meeting place in fact, uh, when the old church closed and we had meetings about where to have the new church, uh, perhaps with tongue in cheek, I suggested that they should, uh, uh, that they should use this as the church, buy a little plot of land nearby for a car park. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, it wasn't quite big enough, there's, there's no doubt. Um, but it, it has been a feature of the parish right from the start. And, uh, and I hope will continue to be so for many years. A special feature of the church here, as you can see, is the Stations of the Cross. And now they were, of course, erected there when the church was opened in 1878. They're made of terracotta. And the architect, not just of the... Um, building itself, but of course of the stations as well, was a man by the name of Hatfield, and his grave is, is in the cemetery there, as is Mr. and Mrs. Foster, who, as I said, were the patrons of the church. The man who built this church is a man by the name of Dowling, and the stations, you'd have to say, are a, are a very, very special feature of this lovely church of St. Michael's. And maybe Vincent would want to say one or two things about the stations or any feature associated with them. All that I can say about them is, as you have said, is that they, I've never seen stations of the cross anywhere to match them in quality. And uh, they, they presented a problem every time the place was redecorated. Uh, because they didn't know whether to leave them as they were or to try and just put a bit of a wash over them. And in the end, that's what they've done. Uh, they've just brightened them up a little bit with a, a pale yellow wash, but every detail is there to be seen. And really, you see on television all sorts of uh, artifacts from all over the country, but these are very special. There's nothing to match them. And it's, it's amazing that when people come in here, they say, oh, I see you clean the stations as well. And of course, we didn't. They're like this for the past 130, 140 years. At a mass recently, I just told the people that for 130 years, because it was 130 years ago that this church was actually officially consecrated and opened, but for 130 years, no one has gone to the toilet here. So I told the people, it's about time you started going now because 130 years is a long time. Now, this, this is the toilet and I'm opening it up now and the Vincent's coming out and it's very, very important these days, I think, to have facilities uh, for the people and that's what our aim is. Our aim is to please the people and to make sure they have every comfort here, as you can see. Well, the church at Solly Street was uh, almost as bad, 
There was one single toilet there for 150 years, but it was down some steps and oh, awfully dingy and dirty. And very few people used it. So the move to the new church at Pickmere Road was, uh, was quite an event for that reason alone. And I would like to just add as well that since we were doing up the church, we thought it'd be a very good idea to um, repair the statues and repaint them. Now, I must thank at this stage a very special person. Yvonne Rini has... Yvonne actually uh, has an MBE and she did the repainting of these statues and I must say she's done a brilliant job. Not just this statue of the Pieta, of course, but of course the two at the sanctuary, which you'll see shortly. One is of the Sacred Heart and the other is of Our Lady. And by the way, way, way back in 1884, uh, there was a statue presented to this church of St. Patrick uh, by the CYMS of Old St. Vincent's down in Solly Street. It was really to, to thank God and thank St. Patrick for his protection of them while they were working on the local um, railway here. Maybe Vincent might know something about that, do you? Or not um, really. I, I just wondered where did that statue of St. Patrick go because it's not here now? Um, well, I don't know, but I do know one of the Vincentians, Father Con Curtin, uh, who was a, a very good priest and a very amusing priest, told a story of uh, uh, somebody dropped at the nativity time, dropped the Black King and broke it in bits and they didn't know what to do. And somebody said, we have a statue of St. Patrick in the sacristy. Let's put boot polish on its face and a hat on it, and that'll do. <laughs> and, and it did. But he said, didn't the woman who presented the Patrick to us come and play holy hell in the sacristy? <laughs> right. Now, going on from there, we're looking at these beautiful pews here, or these church seats. And as you can see... They're made of oak and have, have withstood the test of time. If we could count the number of bums that have sit, sat on those seats to tell its own story. Another thing too, since its inception, since way back in 1878, as I said, it's 130 years now since the place opened, mass has been said here every month of the year for all the dead in the cemetery. And in, in actual fact, there might be about 20,000 people buried here. Some, some graves are paupers' graves because it was shortly after the famine in Ireland that many, many of the Irish people came over to settle at St. Vincent's and Solly Street. And this cemetery here was the first Catholic cemetery in the whole city uh, because the Catholics thought that they should be buried in consecrated ground. Uh, and not just be a part of one of the, the municipal cemeteries. I can confirm that. Um, uh, a man, uh, uh, in these days, people are very interested in tracing their ancestors. So I get requests all the time from people who are looking for, for way back in the 1850s and, and onwards. And we were looking for his family, and we found five of them, and they'd all died young, and every single one of them, and they were Italian, was in a common grave with anything from 19 down to six other people in the same grave. Now, when a lot of them were children, that wasn't too difficult. Uh, but the, there are common graves scattered all over the cemetery, and a particular section down by the road, which was called the St. Vincent's section, which had nothing else but common graves. And Brother Willie Smith, who was sacristan here for 60 years, told me that they used to bring them in fruit boxes. They, they, they had no coffin. And, uh, and, and they hardly held together until they got them in the ground. But then, of course, the Social Security Act came in and everybody was afforded a grave uh, at public expense. This particular crucifix, this particular cross is known as a Sienese cross. And this wasn't put in 
originally, but only about 10, 12 years after the church was opened. And uh, as you can see, it's a very, very special fe feature here. As I said, it's called C and E's. I presume that um, the same cross is in a, in a place called Siena in Italy. We're in the sanctuary now here, and as you can see, the altar is made of polished marble. And in here, or just underneath it there, there is a statue of the dead Christ and a, an angel at his head here. And um, the candlesticks, and they were only put in recently. Uh, and we must, at this stage, thank the Catholic, the, sorry, the Latin Mass Society for giving us those. And, and I must say they gave them to us gratuitously. One day I came in here and they were all on the altar. Um, maybe Vincent would like to say something now at this stage yes. about that particular <clears throat> altar. Well, it's it always been a wonderful feature of, of, the, uh, of the whole chapel. Do you want to look at the camera? It, um, it, it really is extraordinary that in a very small chapel like this, uh, and coming from such poor beginnings, um, the history uh, has recently been written, and it's quite clear that at the beginning, the people, um, the people had very little money. Um, now, the Fosters, of course, helped enormously, and other rich people did chip in. But uh, the people must have thought it was wonderful to come here and to see this magnificent altar. Now, of course, <laughs> rightly or wrongly, everything changed, and the priest now faces the congregation. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm not against that at all. I, I think that's, that's very good. But... It has meant putting an altar in the beginning here. We were mm. given one very kindly by another parish, but it was over large and uh, far more than was needed. So mm. uh, I'm personally grateful to Father Paddy for having got this very nice little altar now that allows you also to see through it and see mm. what's behind it. And it is very good indeed. This is a temporary movable altar and we must thank again the Latin Mass Society for giving us this altar and I designed it in such a way that anyone who comes into the church can see right underneath there and can see this uh, beautiful uh, marble altar at the back and of course the statue of the of the dead Christ and this is, this is the altar we use. This is the altar in which we say Mass on, uh, on the first Monday of every month. And of course, I forgot to tell you also, every bank holiday, we offer a Mass here as well for all those interred in the cemetery. I don't know whether Vincent has something to say about this, but you, you might, there's nothing else to add about that, is there? Only to say that... Uh... Um, we've had one or two altars since it became necessary to face, and mm. this is the best of the lot. It, uh, Grand. It's very neat and easily moved. When the church was opened way back in 1878, these paintings and stencils weren't here at that time. It was only around 1884 uh, when the west window there was added, and these paintings and stencils were added as well. And as you can see, uh, these paintings here are of resurrection scenes. And isn't it only fitting that in the middle of a cemetery we have a church that's proclaiming the resurrection because that's what our faith proclaims, that Christ died and rose again, and it'll be the same with us. This particular one here is the raising of Lazarus, and as we're now in year A, um, we'll soon be reading that in the church. Uh, I think it's on the fifth Sunday of Lent. And the other one here, perhaps a lot of people don't know about it, it's Peter who raised somebody from the dead by the name of Tahita. Now, these paintings have just been uh, cleaned. Um, well, about six months ago they were cleaned, and as you can see, they're back now to their former glory. 
because before that you could har hardly distinguish the paintings from uh, the complete black wall that was there before. These stencils have also been meticulously cleaned, as you can see. And, of course, the whole sanctuary, the paintings on the other wall as well. Before we got this church renovated, there was an awful lot of damp in this particular building. And it took years, actually, to dry out. And I think what happened here some years ago was that the water must have got in and actually damaged this particular part. So somebody just plastered it over. So hence, this particular se section, the stencil, is missing from it. But we're going to put it back to its former glory one of these years. Now, as I said about the other wall, these two also are two resurrection scenes. This particular one was the, the, the raising of the young man, um, the, the widow's son of name. Everyone is familiar with that story. And then the other painting was that little girl who died. She was also raised to life. Um, the daughter of Jairus, I think it was called. And uh, as you can see, the stencils here also. And there's another example of the damage that the, the water leakage have, has done there. But um, the rest of it. Now, if we just... Look at the other um, inscriptions on the wall here. They're all proclaimed, they're all quotations from scripture. First one is, the Lord shall come from heaven. That's taken, I think, from one of the letters of St. Paul, although I'm not 100% sure. And the second part is, the Lord shall come from heaven and the dead who are in Christ shall be the first to rise. Then we who are alive, who are left shall be taken up to meet Christ and so shall we be always with the Lord. Comfort ye one another with these words. And that's precisely what we should be doing. And that's what this church here is really all about, proclaiming the resurrection. And even though the place is full of graves, it's proclaiming life beyond the grave. Now, I must talk about these windows. A very, very special feature, a very special feature of these windows here is that they were designed by a man by the name of Bentley from Doncaster. Now, Mr. Bentley was a very famous designer of stained glass windows because he was also the one who designed the windows in Westminster Cathedral. So we have a special connection here with, Saint, with uh, Westminster, the mother church in England and Wales. Now, if you look at the windows themselves, this one here is of St. John. St. John, who is associated with the Word of God, and uh, he was also there on Calvary. Uh, the central one, of course, is Christ himself rising from the dead. And the other window is of Our Lady. She was also the one who stood at the foot of the cross. We've already spoken about this new toilet here, and we've also put in new heating. When I came here in 2001, all they had in here was about eight or nine gas cylinders, and they've all gone now, and these quite expensive heaters have been installed in the church. Now, if you look also, uh, there's been new lighting, and this new lighting is absolutely fantastic compared to what was here before that, because you could hardly, it was like the light of a candle before, you could hardly read the missile. But now all this new lighting, and this new lighting as well, is not just giving light to the, the main body of the church, but as you can see, it's um, illuminating this beautiful roof, because the church has been re-roofed as well. And um, it's, it's a special feature of the renovation that the lights are focusing on to, to that roof. There's also other additions like this, the, the fire um, sensors up there, and, uh, and also there's a new alarm put in here. So the church is much safer now than it ever was before. But that didn't stop somebody recently from trying to steal some of our lead, which they have done, 
but I caught them red-handed at it. <laughs> and <laughs> after that, then we replaced um, not with we replaced the roof not with other lead, but with a new substance that has no resaleable value. Perhaps it's time now that we just dropped into the sacristy just to see one or two things there. Now I'm going into the sacristy here. Beautiful door here. The, uh, obviously the original door going back to 1878 when the church was opened and consecrated. Going in here now. And... Well, this is the sacristy now. We've also, as you can see, renovated this as well. Before it was renovated, for instance, that whole corner there was uh, completely um, in a bad way. Uh, in fact, none of the plaster was hardly on the wall at all, but that's all been done now. Uh, we've also cleaned this up a bit. And the new feature in here is, of course, this beautiful um, basin which uh, provides the place with water, not just with cold water, but also with hot water. And all the um, electrical stuff is here now, the controls, etc., etc., and the trip switches and things like that. Um, so that's the new feature there. Then, of course, we have all the vestments down here now, and fire alarm there. And um, I'm sure it's still recognisable to what it was before and the Vincentians who, all the Vincentians said Mass here in this church um, will remember this particular sacristy. Well, I hope now you have enjoyed your little guided tour of the church and partly of the cemetery as well. And as I said, Mass is celebrated here on the first Monday of every month and also every bank holiday for all the dead buried here, particularly, of course, the Vincentian priests. And at this point, we'd like to thank the Vincentians and the Vincentian order for all the work and the dedicated work and towards the poor and towards the people of Sheffield generally um, over many, many years. And it's this very year, uh, 2008, which is the 130th anniversary of the opening of this beautiful church. And again, at this point, I'd like to thank the Vincentians for um, donating some of their graves to us so that we, myself and Father John, can eventually be buried here and be among all these wonderful people. Maybe Vincent would like to say a few words now. Well, all that, <clears throat> that I can add is that uh, my grandfather and uh, uh, grandmother and various aunts, uncles, my parents and my wife's parents were all here, all together, all waiting for the, the trumpet on the last day. And it was a standing parish joke that those up the hill there always had a good start because they were nearly vertical and as soon as the trumpet went they could be off and uh, on the way. Uh, it was, uh, uh, I, it's, it's an amazing thing to have a, 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 a parish, it's like a churchyard but it's bigger than most, a good deal bigger than most little tiny plots attached to churches. And people, of course, come from all over Sheffield because virtually every Catholic parish in Sheffield, apart from the cathedral, was founded from St. Vincent's by the slum clearance. They farmed the people out to Prince of Wales Road where St. Teresa's is, to Hillsborough where the Sacred Heart is. Even as far as Deep Car, they, they built a church there by the people who used to come to St. Vincent's. Uh, St. Patrick's, uh, all over the place, all the churches still have people. There aren't too many still alive who were what we would call founder parishioners, uh, but there are plenty of children and grandchildren of those founder parishioners in all these outlying parishes. And of course they all come back here uh, and therefore this is a meeting ground for all the uh, 
Catholics of Sheffield, not just for the parish of St. Vincent's. And that's one of the most wonderful features of the whole thing. And we'd like to say goodbye now, and I hope you really enjoy looking at this video or DVD. And maybe I should add, since my name is Father Paddy Walsh, who comes from Kilmana County, Kilkenny, um, one of the biggest grave monuments here is to the Walsh family of Sheffield. No relation of mine, I might add. Uh, but they were the big name, the big uh, traders here in the town for many, many years. So, goodbye everybody, and God bless, and if you're ever in the area, you're all welcome to call in here and call at my residence as well, which is at 40 Pickmere Road, Crooks, Sheffield. Goodbye now, and God bless you all. Goodbye. And it's goodbye from me, and it's goodbye, goodbye from, from him. him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>